So, so how do I move on? Uh, is it with the arrow? Yes. So the lattice of chemical organization, what's that? Uh, hello, everybody. And uh, this is my, probably, I've done a lot of talks about uh, organizational theory, and always I go a little bit deeper, and always people understand a little bit less. <laughs> so I decided for one time to try to look at the whole history of the whole thing, and then just give the result at the end. And I kind of think that this is a much better way to get everybody to understand what's going on than to just give the result in a technical way, and people cannot actually follow me. And, uh, and the historical problem that gave, the, that gave rise uh, to this kind of, uh, uh, of, uh, of uh, systems uh, was actually that uh, we use ordinary differential equation to model the world, but when you want to model this kind of world where you have a lot of novelty, well, ordinary differential equation just don't make it, because uh, usually we change uh, the quantities, uh, but we don't change the qualities. We don't have new elements uh, coming over. And, uh, and so it's a problem of... Uh, um, it's a problem of diversity in a sense, and new things are coming over. And so the, one of the first papers that started to really talk about this was Walter Fontana, and he was trying to look at constructing molecules and constructing objects, and this is the barrier of objects. And he got inspired, actually, uh, yes, he got inspired by uh, some talks and by a paper from John McCaskill where he defined uh, artificial chemistries. Uh, and, uh, and he was trying different kind of systems, and he started with an RNA model, and then he went into more abstraction and more abstraction until he, ha he got uh, artificial chemistries. And I suppose everybody here knows how they work, but uh, just in case anybody, someone doesn't, uh, it's very simple. Imagine you have a big bucket uh, with a lot of molecules that are running around and are well mixed. You take two uh, at random, you react them, you get the result, you put the result inside, and there are a little bit of differences here and there. In particular, Walter Fontana used a system which it has an infinite kind, an infinite amount of possible molecules. That's something. All the reactions were catalytic, so you take those two, you react them, but you don't use them up and you get a new molecule, and you put that one inside the two. So now you have an extra molecule. You went from two to three, so you take another one at random, and you throw it away. And this gives you an outflux for each molecule. So each molecule is slowly decaying. And then, of course, there is no conservation of mass, and uh, as we've seen, uh, this can be a, a limit, uh, and, and it wasn't well steered, so we had uh, no space. And you can look at uh, the history of artificial chemistry as, in a sense, the history of trying to wiggle out of all those limitations and try to see if you change one of those, what happens if you change this other one, what happens. And for each of those, uh, you usually have more than one paper that try to, t to get over that in different ways. For example, for space, you have a space of artificial chemistry where you put uh, molecules in different places of the grid, or they can be in a planar graph. And when you're speaking about conservation of mass, you can have uh, uh, what Simon Hickingbottom did uh, did I say it right? Well yes. Uh, what Simon said today about having a, a complete mass, a, a complete uh, set of molecules for each, a complete set of atoms for each type, and you don't ever go away from that, or you might want to have a conservation of mass in each reaction, and so on, which is what uh, the toy model in, uh, in Vienna does, and, uh, and so on. Now, what, uh, what Fontana observed was the emergence of uh, this kind of... Uh, you know, the system started to be less diverse with time. So there were new molecules coming out, but eventually the diversity of the molecule disappeared and few molecules started to remain present. So the system did not change qualitatively that much from one point, from one point onward. And you could have like a single molecule that would reproduce itself on and on and on, or you could have, you know, a set of molecules, but somehow you never went out of that set and there was some sort of regularity. And when he looked at those, he realized that there were two properties that represented those sets. They were closed, meaning every time you took two elements, you could actually calculate that the result was always, was always inside of this set. And another one was that they are self-maintaining, meaning every molecule that you take over there, it has a reaction that can reproduce it. So if you have this outflux with molecules coming out and molecules coming out, if something comes out, it also can be recreated. So he presented all this in a, in a paper, 
he presented three different papers, but the, the results were very, very similar. And, I, and I've chosen this one in particular because it speaks about what if the tape were played twice. And those of you who were at the Artificial Life uh, uh, summer school at the beginning, we, there was a speak about, uh, uh, the, um, about uh, the book uh, on what if, the what if the tape was played uh, twice, and this was uh, his answer. You know, still, uh, if the tape was played uh, twice, still we would have uh, hypercycles, still we would have uh, this kind of structures coming out. And uh, notice, he doesn't speak only of those structures, he speaks about structures that combine into higher order self-maintaining organizations, which combine into higher order self-maintaining organizations. So here you have the beginning of some sort of a ladder, and the idea is maybe this ladder would lead to life. And if we're speaking about a ladder, we are actually looking at something like this. And this is the, the normal way of looking at, uh, at things uh, in, uh, uh, in set theory. Also, this one is, uh, is uh, acceptable. This one means uh, this is a set. This is another set that contains this one. This is a third set that contains this one, that contains this one. You might have uh, known this one over here. But not all systems are really hierarchical. Sometimes you have what is a partially ordered structure that is you yes you might have some elements that are hierarchical but you also might have one of those sets which is uncomparable with another set so they might have some elements in common and they but they have some elements which neither of the two have on the other okay that seems uh, uh, quite straightforward and then we had uh, this uh, paper from Banzaf and Banzaf looked at uh, uh, boolean networks and he folded them into matrix and interacted those matrix and then unfold and got a result, interacted through matrix multiplication and unfolded the result. And, uh, and he had 15 molecules and he observed 53 organizations. So this one was, uh, uh, for what I know, the first instance where all of the set that had those properties were actually, were actually mapped. And I think that to find all of them, uh, Wolfgang, please correct me if I'm wrong, used the brute force algorithm. You actually went uh, through all the sets uh, to check out which one were uh, organizations and which one were not. So does this mean that, can we still have uh, novelty if we have a space that we have completely mapped? Well, I would claim that yes, we can still have novelty because locally, when you only look at uh, the molecules that you have in that moment, uh, inside uh, the system, uh, you don't have all the molecules that are possible, and then the system, maybe through a mutation, can generate something new, and it can move from one organization to the other. So from this point of view, novelty is a subjective, while the map is a map of the whole system. And then a mathematician came in, and this mathematician said, yes, so this is nice, but we can actually define a, a, an operator. And this operator associates uh, to each set of molecule an organization. So to each set of molecules, we can associate one of those sets, uh, such that if I have two sets and one is inside the other, the associated sets uh, are also one inside the others. Uh, they don't have to be one inside of the others. So you can have two sets that lead to the same one, because the organizations are less uh, than all the possible sets. Uh, but uh, it, but if, if this is... Uh, true, then the other one is also true. And, and so if you have, uh, if you have this uh, operator, now if you look uh, at the system and you look at all the organizations, uh, now you can define a lattice. You can define an algebra and you can define a lattice. Now what is a lattice? I hope I have it in the next slide. Yes, I have it in the next slide. So a lattice is a particular partially <coughs> ordered set uh, so I'm trying to show that what we have over here is not just a bunch of sets, but they actually have a structure inside. And so, in particular, a lattice is such that given any two of those sets with those properties, their union, we can define a union of those two sets that also have this property. And it's not the set union. You know, we have to associate an element in particular. And uh, this is from Wikipedia. So if you go on the Wikipedia lattice, you will actually find uh, this definition, and, uh, and which is the union. And you also can find uh, the intersection, and also that is unique. So let's try to see what does it mean. If we have two 
two of those sets uh, and one contains uh, the other, the union of the two will be the one above, the intersection of the two will, will be the one below. If you have two and they are non-comparable, the union of the two will be another one above and the intersection of the two will be another one below. This is, so it looks like it's so basic that everything should be a lattice. I mean, can you have something which is not a lattice? Well, yes, you can. And this is an example of something which is a partially ordered set, but it's not a lattice. If I ask you what is the union of A and B, will you answer me C1 or C2? And you don't know both of them in the sense of union, so there is not a unique union. And if you remember the definition of lattice, there is a unique union that gives this. So, so at that point we went back to look at the end top, and, uh, and we looked at this at the lattice, and we draw this uh, as a lattice, uh, and now we don't have 53 organizations, we have 54. Why is it so? Because we've added an organization. And what was that organization? Is this one down over here. To actually have this as a lattice, uh, we have to have the empty set uh, as an organization. That's something that uh, only a mathematician with his weird brain could actually think, and when we explain this to chemists, it's always a little bit of a problem. <laughs> now that you have the uh, now that we have those lattice, we presented another paper. I was invited in Japan, and with Peter we presented we prepared this paper, and basically it said if you have the lattice, you can actually track the system, the behavior of the system on this lattice, because we know that to each set we can refer to, an, to, a, to a place in the organization, so we can actually say, now we are under this organization, now we are under this one, now we've changed it, we are under this one, and so on. So we can actually map them around. And we found that although uh, stable points and stable sets, when the system got stable, it was always in an organization, not all organizations were stable. So, for example, in this particular uh, organization, in this particular artificial chemistries, those are all the organizations, this is the empty set, and uh, this one is uh, stable, this one is stable, this one is stable, but if you are over here, you tend to fall down, and uh, so on. So yes, everything can be generated, but statistically, not everything does get generated. So, of course, once you've reached that point, you want to find uh, the lattice of organization. So if someone comes to me and says, this is uh, uh, an artificial chemistry, please uh, help me to study it, I say, let's find uh, the lattice. And finding the complete lattice of organization is, uh, it was an interesting problem. And of course, uh, we can use the brute force algorithm, which sometimes you can use if you don't have too many molecules, but uh, when you start to have hundreds of molecules, you have two elevated to a hundred sets that you actually need to test, and they start <coughs> to become too many. So at that point, uh, uh, at that point with, uh, with Peter, a lot of this work have been done uh, with Peter, also with, uh, with Wolfgang at the beginning, and then uh, Peter continued it, uh, continued it uh, later, and there's uh, much more work uh, coming over. And so we actually formalized uh, all this uh, in, a, in a much better way. Remember that before, the only artificial chemistry that we had uh, were those abstract chemistries. Uh, you know, where all their reactions were catalytic, everything, all the molecules would, would decay, would fall away, and so on. So the question is, can we make a definition of, uh, or, of organization that is also valid for uh, biology in general, for chemistry, and uh, for systems biology, and so on? And actually, we were able to do it. You, you can look at the paper to find the actual definition. It was a little bit more complicated because we had to define semi-self-maintenance uh, semi and self-maintenance and semi-organization and organization. And the most interesting thing that we find is that not all sets, not all type of systems form a lattice. Depending on some elements on, on how the system is organized, some forms a lattice and some does not. I will simply tell you that if every molecule has an outflux, then the system always forms a lattice. And if it doesn't have an outflux, usually it doesn't, uh, but there are some exceptions. So, and then I put all these together and I put some other work inside, also regarding space, also regarding conservation of mass, actually. And, uh, and I presented all this in my PhD. And after I got my PhD, and, 
and I had it in my hand, and I was sure that nobody was going to take it away, we went to a pub. And while we were over there, and I was sure that nothing was going to happen anymore, I said to Peter, okay, we've proven that uh, those systems for malattis, so what? And uh, he said, uh, well, so lattices are beautiful. Well, yes, but not enough. There actually there is uh, some other things. So because they form a lattice, you can use the theorems inside lattice theory to actually find the whole, orga the whole lattice. And so if you want to find the whole lattice of organizations, you also you want to find not just the list of organizations, but given any two set, what is their union and what is their intersection. So basically, you're looking for a list and two tables. Let's... And, and so I wrote an algorithm that, uh, create, that, uh, that finds uh, this, uh, and uh, generally it starts with some organization. All the time that it finds uh, that it has those organizations, it calculates all the union and all the intersection, trying to expand it as much as possible until it cannot expand it anymore, and that's a lattice. But it's not the complete lattice. It's just a lattice, so it is, it's a sub-lattice of the complete lattice. And then I'm looking for another organization by taking some one of those organizations and adding a molecule and so on. And, uh, and then I have to decide which molecules to ignore and which not to ignore. And uh, this has been actually solved in the paper. There is a theorem. I called it an organization left behind because really every organization can be found with this algorithm. It was actually proven. And um, so, but of course in all this, uh, we had to all the time do a lot of union and intersection. So doing the union and intersection can be a costly operation. So what if we don't have to do this union and intersection because we already know what is the result? And, uh, and so there are some theorems in lattice theory that we can apply. For example, suppose that you have A and B that are two organizations and their union forms S. Now it means that any organization in between here and any organization in between here their union also will form S, so I don't have to calculate it. Now, uh, at this point, if I look at all the organizations find, in, found in a run, and I see how many of those union and intersection in the table I had to actually calculate, and how much I could just derive from my theorems, the number that I had to calculate at the beginning was 100% because I, I knew nothing about the system. But as I started knowing about the system, it started to decrease as a power law. You see, it's a log-log plot, and it's pretty straight. So the takeaway message is, uh, if there is something that has mathematical property in your system, use it. You know, not just say, oh, it's nice, it has this mathematical property. You actually can use it. And uh, the code is on GitHub. Uh, this is my GitHub. It's down over here. And uh, by the way, there's a lot of open problems, so don't think that this is, it finishes here. Uh, for example, given a lattice, can you find an artificial chemistry that creates it uh, and without uh, just asking one of your students? Another one, no, this is normally the, the standard way of doing it. <laughs> Another way is that if you have an artificial chemistry, can you use it as a finite state machine? Because the artificial chemistry stays in, a, in an organization and then you send a molecule and that's a signal and it moves it into another state. So that's a finite state machine. Can you actually use it like that? Can you design it so that it works in this way? In this way? So about what are the organizations inside of the cell? And uh, how does evolution appear on the lattice? I mean, is it true, as, uh, as Walter Fontana said, that you are actually going up in a hierarchical system? And I had some paper in the past that showed that uh, it's not always like that, unfortunately. And how do you represent uh, uh, space and membranes? And I think this is it. Yes. What difference does it make on the level of the lattice? That uh, you had different organizations locally. Okay. So that, uh, and uh, then we explored but it. How do they relate? Because you said we could. Sure. Uh, and uh, that depends on how you are, uh, you are modeling uh, space. So you could do it as a grid, and molecules can, are free to move around, and then organization just float. Uh, Around, I don't know if you could uh, if you could find uh, uh, spatial.
physical things that remain, that are stable. They tended to eventually to dissolve. Another one is actually to do a planar graph. And I learned now that what I used back in 2001 is now called an Apollonian graph. And I did not know at the time. But what you tend to do is that what it tends to come out is that molecules that are uh, that do not react, they tend to form some sort of membrane, and then you tend to have inside to have an area of activity which, are, which do not uh, speak to each other because of those membranes. And, uh, and then they can have different organizations, so you can have different cells with different organizations. And in that model I actually have a conservation of mass, so every now and then I would uh, kill a bunch of uh, molecules, because if not it would not be able to grow anymore. And, uh, and the membrane, the molecules were elastic if there was not enough mass for it to, to work. So when the things were released, now a lot of those membranes became uh, thinner, and it would react a little bit more and make bigger cells, and then it would clump again into smaller systems. But it surely needs uh, much more, uh, much more uh, research. Absolutely. Uh, so you mentioned that some organizations are stable and some are not stable, and you can yeah. see things falling around. So uh, at the open evolutionary, open-ended evolutionary talks, there's a lot of discussion about definitions of open-ended evolution. Could we perhaps look at the lattices of these systems to see if they form loops where if you start in this cycle, you will go around and your evolution will be closed? Uh, uh, and otherwise, where else? Where else can you go? You normally can only go down. Normally can only. Go. You normally can only go down if you go because those are closed. Those are closed set. So by definition, you can only go down. When they are unstable, you go down. You don't go up. And by the way, there is a talk tomorrow by this lady over here. Uh, sorry, I, I still don't remember the name. Chuyen. Chuyen. And, uh, and uh, she's actually exploring, uh, given the lattice, uh, with what probability you go from one organization to another and so on. But then when you want to go up, uh, you need to have uh, some uh, either a mutation yeah. or, uh, uh, or some... You could actually have two systems uh, that they speak to each other. And then uh, you can ask yourself uh, what happens if you couple them uh, with, uh, with little. This is all kind of uh, work that we, we have to... Uh, to look at and we haven't uh, looked at. But cycles is a little bit difficult unless you actually have uh, some message that are always the same coming from outside. So well, I was hoping that you were going to say, oh yes, we've looked at mutations and you can get cycles that go up and down, but like it sounds like you haven't... Not, not yet. Yeah. Okay. Not yet. So uh, I think, the, first of all, infinite lattices, do they show up? And would they by definition be not interesting uh, in the way that you know, if you look at a random space of Turing machine computations, most random Turing machines either quickly die or loop forever. The space of Turing machine computations, which end after a finite period, are actually sparse and interesting. I would sort of conjecture, having seen your talk, that artificial chemistries are interesting to the extent that they are large and finite. Yes. Do you think that's a fair characterization? Yes, so it is possible to have infinite lattices. And uh, I have looked uh, at uh, artificial chemistries that has uh, universal computation uh, capabilities, and uh, the evolution was uh, incredibly boring. And it was incredibly boring because of this uh, universal computation capability. Uh, I've, uh, uh, you could look at a paper called uh, Flying over, over Mountain Probability that I presented at ENICAL, and basically it says because it is so easy, to get universal computation capability, it's very easy once you have an organization to get a mutation and just the system is universal and the result of this is that it just jumps to some other place of the whole lattice. But you don't have any uh, slow progress uh, somehow. And, uh, and you can have a very large uh, space, so you can have something that is, uh, that, still you can, that is still very interesting. For example, the system that I presented over here the here I arrived at 10,000 organizations, but actually the whole system, uh, I could not map all the organizations that were present. There were um, 500, 512 molecules. There were two elevated to 512 possible sets. And I don't know how many organizations. The computer of the university crashed after, uh, 70, after we reached 70,000 and uh, 300 gigabyte of RAM. Okay, I have a last question. 
uh, this algorithm, is it NP complete or is it uh, of a lower uh, scaling behavior? So is it actually usable? Uh, okay. Lo Usually it's, uh, I, I, I know that Peter is, uh, is uh, smiling because he knows much more about uh, this uh, than me. I'll try to give an answer and then you correct me. So, uh, I, at the worst case, I think it is uh, NP. Nevertheless, very, very often you do not have uh, the worst case. Uh, and we could actually find uh, that uh, you basically never are in that case. It's really, really difficult to find a situation that is uh, in that case. Um, let's. Peter, you want to add something? Okay. Okay. Um, just because it's empty doesn't mean you can't solve it. Sorry? Oh. Just because the problem is empty doesn't mean you can't solve it. No, no, no of course not. It's not a question whether it's applicable in an easy way. Okay. Thank you very much.